All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andrea Jones, and I am from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, and the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And I am here today to talk about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and also a little bit about LADEE since it launched last night, as some of you are aware. And so I felt like as a lunar science representative, I have to touch on that a little bit. Um, and then just to tell you a little bit about how you can get involved if you are interested in learning more about lunar science and some of the things that are out there for you to do that. So before I get started with LRO, I wanted to introduce myself a little bit um, because not every speaker is connecting with their audience and, and just to tell you so that you are aware of where I come from a little bit. Um, my name is Andrea and I am a planetary geologist. So I um, have been interested in Earth and space science for as long as I can remember. Um, and I studied geology as an undergraduate and then went and taught out in the mountains in California and taught middle school and elementary school students about rocks and birds and stars and also line dancing and astronomy um, and, and adventure courses. So it was really fun out there. Um, and then I, I married a geologist as well sitting over here. And so we honeymooned in Iceland. And because, you know, where else would you go besides a land of glaciers and volcanoes um, and aurora? So that was perfect for two um, rock stars, as I like to think of myself. Um, and here I'm holding, you can't really tell, but that's the coolest bread I've ever come across. It doesn't taste maybe as good as some other breads, but it's geothermal bread and it's cooked underground next to a geyser. So I thought that was really cool. And I also, um, I'm so delayed to be here because of course I am also an amateur astronomer enthusiast, or an astronomy enthusiast. So this is my cat, this is Betelgeuse, named after the star in Orion. And this is last Halloween. She is Betelgeuse the cat dressed up as Betelgeuse the red giant. So, so this is where I'm coming from. So I'm really delighted to be here today. I've never been to the Almost Heaven Star Party before. Um, this is my first time and the sky was amazing last night. So thanks to all the, what, the folks who organized this, picking the weather, that was really nice, really appreciated. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited to be here talking about um, LRO, but that's not all I do, uh, just in case you're curious what an education and public outreach specialist at NASA does. Um, I work very closely with science teams. Um, I am in the planetary division, so the solar system exploration division, and I work with the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover. So over here I have some toys, mixed lunar science and um, Mars science. Um, and so I get to go to team meetings and be on the science listservs and, and go to the professional science conferences and hear what's going on and then interpret that and bring it to different audiences. I also work, of course, with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and I also work with a mission called MAVEN, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Environment Explorer, um, which is launching in November from Cape Canaveral. Um, so and I, I work with a lot of educators. I do teacher workshops in Idaho and Colorado and different places. Um, that's me with the sample analysis at Mars um, test bed, which is uh, an equivalent of the flight instrument on Mars, but we do experiments in the lab on Earth so we can figure out you know, what data we're getting from Mars and what that looks like and, and how to translate it. Um, and also I do analog festivals in Death Valley, which is really fun, a very Mars friendly environment, um, a lot of similarities um, and classroom presentations and, and me with the full scale rover. So anyway, we do a lot of different things. And if you are interested in learning more about what an education and public outreach specialist does, come and talk to me. So I'm gonna talk about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But before I just tell you about the mission, I want you to understand the motivations for the mission. And I wanted to know if any of you had any thoughts about why NASA was interested in sending a spacecraft to the moon. Why would you do that? Why would you go? Yeah. Because part of the moon um, shares a lot of the same geology with the Earth. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Why would you go? Helium free. Okay, and, and tell us why that's interesting. Uh, allegedly, we can get a lot of power off of that. <laughs> yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? History of the solar system? Yeah, absolutely. 
So there's a lot you can learn about the Earth and about where we are by going to the moon. And so NASA wanted to go to the moon actually originally um, to help establish a greater human presence in the solar system. So it was intended as a, a launching point for maybe human presence on Mars, maybe elsewhere, maybe an asteroid. But that was actually part of uh, President Bush's, the, the second President Bush, um, his vision for space exploration was to go to the moon and establish a lunar base. And LRO was a presidentially mandated mission so that we could map it and find out what is there, what resources do we have, things like that, so that we could establish a lunar base. Um, so that was originally why we, we put this mission together, and it was under go, 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 go. It was, it was put together very quickly as um, compared to some other missions that are launched. Um, but since that time, we have a new president, of course, and he has a different vision for space exploration. And so everything that we are collecting is still um, something that could be used for future human establishment of a base on the moon or, or elsewhere. Um, but right now we have converted into a science-driven mission. So exploration into to science was really what we did. Um, but okay, so if we're going to go and establish a lunar base on the moon, which is what LRO was intended to do, or to get ready to do, what kind of information would you want to collect? Is there water? Is there water? That's a good question, yeah. Why would you want water? To sustain life. Okay, so we happen to like water. That, that is a very helpful thing. Hopefully all of you have been drinking, um, staying hydrated. Yes, so we need water, absolutely. What else would you want if you were gonna have a human presence on the moon for you know, some length of time, perhaps a permanent base on the moon staffed. What would you want there? A cave to live in. So some sort of protection, yeah, okay. Figure out where you should, where you should establish the base. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? You probably could manufacture things there that you could in here, right? Like the, the low gravity, like the, I know the ball bearings and things that they make in space, it could be perfect. Here there's flaws. So, so some sort of resource development. You'd want a little. Something in the moon that they could extract the so resources on the moon. What can you use? Absolutely. Yeah. So these are some of the things that NASA decided would be good if they were to establish a lunar base on the moon. They wanted to know what's the lunar surface like. So let's figure out, you know, what, what are we dealing with in terms of the 3D surface um, map? We want to know what that's like. We want to know what the radiation environment is like. Any idea why we care about that? <laughs> yeah, you need some serious sunblock if you go to the moon. Absolutely. We want to know what's going to happen to you if you go are you going to turn to goo? Are you going to fry? What is going to happen to your body? We want to know this so that we can prepare for that lunar base if we're going to have one. We also want to look for those resources, see what is there, see what we can find. And ice, yes, water ice is definitely a resource, but there are others. For example, sunlight. Why is sunlight so important if you're going? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I think is really cool is it's not just sunlight being there, the presence of sunlight, but actually the absence of sunlight is also very interesting because when there is no sun in an area, we can get really, 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 really cold temperatures. And that cold trap can trap um, different volatiles that are very interesting and also potentially useful as resources as well. So that's, that's something that we're interested in. And identifying hazards for landing sites. This is kind of important also. In order to establish a base, you want to make sure you can land safely and maybe have a nice flat area to build on if that's what you're looking for or you know a cave environment, something like that as well. So those are some of the things that NASA was looking for when, when making this mission. So it, it um, sent out a call for different instruments to be able to fill these requirements. So let's talk about some of the things that LRO brought with it. So we have LOLA, 
the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter. So Lola is actually really cool. Has anyone, um, is anyone familiar with Lola or Mola, its grandma? So, so there's a lot of heritage in different um, space instruments. So we, when, when you figure out how to build something, it's cheaper next time to build basically the same thing and just improve it. So there is a line of um, altimeters out in the solar system. MOLA, the Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter, um, came. And also, I think there's one even before MOLA. Um, and then there's one on Mercury as well. And so, and now there's, um, Lola, so and and there will certainly be another one in the future, but they get better every time. And so Mola used to um, send a laser down to the surface, and then when it came back, it could calculate the amount of time it took for the laser beam to go down. And then when it came back, that's the distance between the spacecraft and the surf surface divided by two, because of course the time goes from when it leaves to when it hits its surface and back. So half that time is how far it is to the surface. Um, and Lola has done that, only it splits its laser beam in five. So there are actually five laser pulses that go down to the surface and come back. And each of those, they measure the length of time that it took to get to the surface. And they also measure the strength of the signal that's returning. So if you imagine um, sending a laser pulse down to a mirror, what kind of reflection would you expect? A strong reflection. If you send it down to maybe asphalt or something, or a really rough, rocky area, what would you expect? A weaker signal. So that's exactly what Lola is looking for. So if it has a really strong signal, that means something different about the surface than if it gets a weak signal. So they look for that as well. So they're able to figure out the topography. So actually we have excellent topography data from Lola um, and also can figure out the surface roughness and it can figure out the slope of the surface because of that five beam approach. So if you have you know, your five pulses going down together and then they come back oriented slightly differently, that's because the, some of them took longer to get back and some of them took less time and that indicates a slope. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so and, and Lola can also figure out where some of these permanently shadowed areas are um, because of topography models. So I just wanna stop and, and find out, are all of you familiar with permanently shadowed regions on the moon? There are some areas on Mercury too. So I'm gonna, just because I don't have a whole bunch of nods in the audience, so I'm gonna make sure that we all are familiar with what's going on. So I'm gonna grab a moon globe here. And Earth is tilted. Anyone know how, how much Earth is tilted off of its axis? Yeah, so 23 and a half degrees off of its axis. How far is the moon tilted? About one and a half degrees. So it's pretty much upright. So Kevin, I'm gonna ask you to come up and, and help me here with a demonstration. So can you turn this on here? So here we go. This is my impact crater, okay? So it's a, a fairly simple model, so simple bowl-shaped crater. So if we have an impact crater on the moon at the equator, can you turn on the light? All right, so, and I'm gonna have you turn this way. So what do you see inside that crater if it's around the equator? It's got sunlight, yeah. So, um, what's your name? Charlotte. Charlotte, can you come on up here? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to tell everyone what you see as I move this crater to a higher latitude. Okay, so see how much sunlight you see in there? Yeah. A, a lot of sunlight? I see so yeah, I see sunlight. Okay, so tell the audience what's going on as I move this crater to a farther... Well, as it moves, you see less and less of the, this, this face here, less inside here. Okay, so what, what is happening inside the crater? It's darkening. It's darkening because of what? because of the inclination of the, of the moon and the fact that the sun never reaches it. And what's blocking it? What's, what's the, the impact, the impact crater, the slope of the... Yeah, so the rim itself is blocking. And so now when I get to the top here... You don't see anything. Nothing in the, into the crater. You can't see into the crater. So does, does everyone understand that? 
Okay, so thank you, and thank you. So our permanently shadowed craters are at the poles of the moon. So either way, um, we can have areas that don't get sunlight for billions of years. That's a very long time to not have sunlight. And again, that's where it gets really cold. And these are of particular interest to um, people who are studying the moon because, again, that really cold area. Um, and so the poles are a very unique environment. And the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was commissioned to actually be a polar orbiter. So it could study those poles a lot. OK, so let's talk about some other, some other instruments. Yes? What about the it, we, it never gets any sunlight. <gasps> it does. It does. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, OK. Yes, I'm going. Uh, well, if you would like to stay afterwards, I would love to show you that every part of the moon gets an equal amount of sunlight, whether it's the near side or the far side, except for, again, those permanently shadowed regions. But if you would like to play and dance around and learn about how all sides of the moon get equal illumination, stay with me. I would love to talk to you. Do you have a question or a comment? Uh, one question or comment. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the orbiter is in a polar orbit, but that's a standard mapping orbit, not just for, uh, for the purpose of you know, looking at the poles. It's the purpose. It's the one orbit that gets you a, a straight down look at every part of the moon. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, to demonstrate that, um, so so LRO is is flying around in a fixed orientation in space um, around the poles, but the moon is orbiting underneath it. So absolutely, that, that really helps you get a nice mapping orbit, and a lot of spacecraft do that as well. LRO in particular was interested in, in the poles, so that also gives you more time over the poles because, of course, you cross over them every orbit, and you get a lot more data there. Um, LADI, for example, is, is taking an equatorial orbit because it's really interested in the terminator. So that, isn't that the greatest geology word ever or astronomy word? The terminator is the line between day and night. And, and every dawn this evening when the sun goes down, you are on the terminator. So make sure you tell people this. I love that. I think that's, I learned that in college. I wish I had learned that earlier. But yes, so, um, so LADI is taking an equatorial orbit because it's interested not in mapping what's on the surface, but in, in finding out what happens at that day-night line. So thank you. Yeah, excellent. OK, so the camera, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, LROC, um, is actually made of three different cameras. Um, there are two, oh, I didn't put the label, sorry. This is the wide angle camera. And this is the narrow angle camera. So the wide angle camera is intended for a context view of the surface to figure out what is out there and, and to really get data from the entire lunar surface, but in a lower resolution, about 100 meter, meters per pixel. Um, the narrow angle camera can actually see you. If you were to go to the moon and lay down and make a, make a, a moon angel, it would see you. It can see down to about 25. Um, centimeters per pixel. Um, so it can resolve things down to about a meter um, in diameter. So it's a really high resolution camera. And this is, is similar to the high resolution imaging science experiment on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, which, is, which is taking pictures of Mars right now, in case you've heard of that. OK. So and this, again, is you know, imaging the surface. We can get a lot of information about the surface. And it also can tell us about hazards and illumination uh, as well as we're repeat imaging. Yes? Uh, I noticed you, have a, you left off your first bullet. Uh, oh. Uh, does all of that information come and get sorted out at once, or do you use filters, insertable filters to pick wave bands? So it actually, so the, um, the, the camera just has, uh, it, it's focused on the optical, but it extends into the UV and the infrared, and it's all collected at one time. So that, that is just all at so once. So you're not getting any spectroscopic information? Not from okay. LROC, no. I mean, you can sort of get that out by, um, but, but not, it's, it's yeah. intended as an imager, not as a spectrometer. Um, diviner, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can get some spectro spectroscopic information. Um, okay, so diviner, 
Thanks for leading into that. Is um, it, it measures the surface and slightly into the subsurface temperatures of the moon. Um, and that is really interesting because, of course, it can identify those cold traps. Um, but it also uh, it collects data in a way that you can actually get a little bit of the mineralogy, a little bit um, of, of features like what is the surface made of. And not only that, you can figure out what is on the surface, whether it's rocky or whether it's dusty because of the thermal inertia of the surface. So to figure out, you know, a rock will cool off and heat up differently than a bunch of dust. And so by taking um, data at different times of day, it can figure out what the surface is made of, which is also useful for when we try to land on it. Um, and this, of course, rocky areas, that's important for landing as well. So diviner. Okay, then we have LAMP, which is one of my favorite acronyms of them all because what it does is it looks inside um, permanently shadowed craters. So as you are all aware, last night when you looked up in the sky, there were a whole lot of what? Stars. stars. And what do stars produce? Light. Well, we can actually use that light, that reflected starlight coming out of the permanently shadowed craters to see in the dark with lamp. Isn't that fantastic? I love that. So, so lamp can actually collect data over time to, to make out what, what the interior of those craters look like even without sunlight ever reaching them. All right, then we have LEND. LEND is the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector. And what it does is it searches really for, or it, it, it measures the flux of neutrons coming off the surface. So the amount of neutrons coming off the moon, and actually it, it does collect radiation from elsewhere as well, but, but it is focused on the moon to figure out what's coming off of that surface. And Based on the amount of neutrons coming off, it searches for hydrogen. So because a neutron is about the same mass as a hydrogen atom, we can, um, it, when a neutron interacts with a hydrogen atom, it actually slows down a lot. Because, for example, if you had a ball and you were hitting it around against balls of fairly equal size, that ball would lose a lot of energy quickly. But if you were to throw a ball around among huge balls, like a bowling ball. If you were to throw um, like a tennis ball against a bowling ball, you get a lot of energy back. But if you throw a tennis ball against another tennis ball, less energy. Um, so not a very good explanation. Sorry about that. I should show you a visualization <laughs> if you'd like a better explanation. But basically, it searches for hydrogen. Hydrogen slows down the neutrons. And then it measures the amount of fast neutrons coming off the surface and the amount of slow. There are a lot of slow neutrons that indicates more hydrogen in the soil, and that will indicate where water is likely. And if there are a lot of fast neutrons coming off the surface, that means there's probably not much hydrogen, and that means that there's probably not much water, or there is not much hydrogen and probably not much water. So long story short, it, it's searching for likely ice deposits on or just underneath the surface. All right, then we have mini RF. So MINI-RF is a radar instrument. So it's this giant um, instrument on the side. And this is the one that was actually mandated also. This is a, a technology demonstration. And they were trying to figure out, and the military actually wanted this um, on board LRO. So this is the only one that was required to come in. And it uses different bands of radar to image the surface. And it can identify um, ice deposits. It can also see a little bit below the surface, which is very interesting um, when combined with visible imagery. And I'll show you that a little bit later. You can see some things like impact melt underneath the regolith, even when you can't see that invisible imaging. Um, and so it, it's kind of a neat combination with some of the other data sets. OK, then we have Crater. And this is the last of the seven instruments on board LRO. And Crater is the one that is searching or trying to figure out what the radiation environment is like at the moon. So Crater has a tissue equivalent plastic inside. So it's sort of like a piece of an arm in there. That just sounds fascinating. Human tissue equivalent plastic. Yeah. 
I think we could have a whole lecture on that. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. You, and actually, there are some fascinating scientists on the Crater team, and, and I have listened to whole lectures on that, and it's really cool. Um, but yeah, it, it's trying to figure out what would happen to your skin, your, your muscle, your bone, what, what happens. And the way it does it is it has um, different uh, plates inside of it that measures what kind of radiation is going through each plate, and, and then it can figure out how much energy is lost within the plastic, meaning how much energy you would absorb from that radiation. And the more you absorb, the more unfortunate consequences you may have later. <laughs> so we really want to know how to protect, protect ourselves and what we need to protect ourselves from if we are to spend a long time on the lunar surface. So those are um, the instruments on board LRO that were, that were collected to satisfy that sort of exploration concept. Yeah. Um, I, I probably don't know enough to ask this question, but I know that there are things like devices that can measure radiation, but it might not be the same type of radiation. Like those things that people wear that, like they, and then they're cumulative. I mean, can you send something like that up as well? Or is that not the same type of radiation? <sighs> so. That's wrong. That's different. The, the, those simulators are usually designed to measure any kind of ionizing radiation. So we don't get a lot of information about exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty expensive instrument. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't know enough about the technology to, to figure out what is what, but, um, but for Crater, it is trying to figure out what kind of, um, it, it can just measure the, the energy of the radiation, and so by, and also by monitoring, for example, what the sun is doing at any particular time, you know, the solar observatory say, hey, there's a big solar storm going on, and Crater gets all excited because they're like, okay, let's, let's go look at this. And, and actually, Crater's really excited because um, the solar cycle is about 11 years long, and it's now been up there for enough time. It, it started at a very low solar activity, and now it's ramping up, and so it's able to find out, you know, how the sun changes, how the, the dose rate changes over time. And what I think is really interesting, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I wasn't really familiar with galactic radiation as opposed to solar radiation, but solar radiation, when the sun is really active, it sort of pushes this bubble of, of solar energy out into the solar system and sort of acts as a block for the galactic cosmic rays. But then when the sun is less active, that bubble sort of shrinks and more galactic radiation comes in when the sun is less active. And I did not know that. I thought that was really cool. And it goes out in this cool spiral pattern as the sun is spinning around. And wow, very cool. Um, but it is trying to figure out the different levels. And, and galactic rays, though there are less of them, they're really more energetic. Um, and so we're trying to figure out whether a few um, galactic rays that are cr really, really, really energetic cause more damage than you know, a whole bunch of solar radiation that's maybe more frequent. So we're not really sure. We're trying to figure that out. OK, so LRO also had science objectives. And these are more of the primary objectives now that we're not as focused on the human exploration side. Um, but we really want to understand from the beginning of the mission, um, the impact history of the moon. So what has been going on, that huge amount of, of stuff out in space, what has happened to the moon over time because of the impacts? Um, the geologic processes, what's been going on on the surface? You know, volcanoes, we have regolith formation, we have a lot of different things going on. What is that like? Um, and the regolith as well. And so we also want to know about those volatiles. So that's the, the stuff like water and mercury and other things that sort of become gases very easily. Um, they can be trapped, and we want to know about those. And again, that lunar radiation environment, we want to know more about that. So with all of those things in mind, we did launch. Um, and on June 18th of 2009, we, we went up. Um, and we were launched from Cape Canaveral with a sister uh, spacecraft, LCROSS. Does anyone know about LCROSS? So LCROSS, um, what, and I really should remember that acronym. Anyone remember Lunar Crater Observing Satellite something? Anyone want to help me with that? I never remember. It's just LCROSS. So LCROSS was um, LRO sister spacecraft. And what it was was um, we had a little bit of extra room in our rocket. And so they sent out a call to the community and said, hey, we've got this much space. Anyone want to fill it up? 
Yes. Bell Cross is Lunar Crater Obser Observation and Sensing Satellite. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks for helping me Thank out. You, you I got to write that on my forehead or something. I don't know. Thank you. So, so what um, a science team proposed is said, hey, you know, we really want to know what's in those permanently shadowed craters at the moon. Let's throw something at it and analyze what comes up. So this is, you know, we, we took a spacecraft and we, we took the, the spent stage of the rocket that had the fuel in it before and we threw it down and then Elcross sort of zoomed in afterwards and analyzed spectra and collected images and, and just tried, no actually didn't really collect images, we took images of it. Um, but it was trying to figure out what was in those craters and so that launched along with LRO but LRO took about four and a half days to get to the moon and Elcross took about a month because it, it went into a different sort of orbit so it could impact um, directly and so the the, the spent rocket stage hit the moon, and then about five seconds later, Elcross hit. So one of the shortest um, science missions ever. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was a pretty cheap one, and it actually found a lot of cool stuff. It did find water, um, it did find mercury, um, and it found some other volatiles as well that we're still even analyzing today. Um, and also, LRO just went into a, a, a very circular orbit at first. Um, as we've moved out and we're in the extended science mission now, um, we have changed that orbit to conserve fuel, but, but the initial mapping orbit was pretty close. So let's get on to some science results. I've sort of led up to this for a long time, but I want to show you some cool stuff that we have found. And some of this is from early in the mission and some of this is recent. Um, I also am going to say that this is a selected amount of science results because I have been trying to figure out what to put in here for a while and I just couldn't put everything in. So if you have a favorite result that I don't include, shout it out because there are many, many more. Um, but here are some of the top ones. So I think some really exciting things are the imaging that we've done of the, of the surface. And we have imaged the entire moon about five times now. Um, in, in, in the same sun angle. So we have imaged the moon many, many, many times. We, it takes about two and a half hours to orbit the moon um, for LRO, but we have imaged the moon many times, but none of this is really redundant because we can look at different sun angles, we can look from different angles down, and we can collect all of that information and actually learn new things based on, you know, making digital elevation models of the surface if we have different sun angles. Um, so really, really neat. Our, our imaging is just spectacular. So these actually don't even look that good with all the light, sorry. But I had to blow them up because they just look so pretty. Um, so this is a near side mosaic that's uh, straight down imaging. And um, it's just, I don't know, I think it's so pretty. So I had to put it up. But we have different ways of looking at this. So I'm not even sure with all of the light if you can really see a difference here. But hopefully you can tell it's a little bit different. This is. Um, not too long ago, actually, they came out. So the, the last uh, mosaic was from straight down imaging, but there are a, there's a little bit of a difference in the sun angle. Um, but this one, this entire mosaic is from when the sun is directly overhead each point on the surface, which of course doesn't happen in nature, but because we are able to take pictures at different times of day, we can see what the sun looks like with or what the surface looks like when the sun is straight overhead. We also have mosaics when the sun is at, you know, 30 degrees or 45 degrees or different different angles, and that pulls out different information. So when it's overhead, you really get an albedo. You get to see what the color, what the reflectance of the surface is like. Um, when the sun is at a, a lower angle in the sky, you can see more information about topography and things like that. So you can use all of these data sets um, in different ways. All right. We also, every time we go over an Apollo landing site, we take a picture because one, Mark Robinson, the principal investigator of this, is an Apollo fanatic, as is pretty much everyone else in the lunar science community at NASA, as you may imagine. Um, so we, we cannot get enough Apollo images. Um, but, but having them at different times actually really tells us more information. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Um, but I, I do want to point out, I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but this is from Apollo 11, and you can actually see footprints. And I know this is a group of astronomy enthusiasts in here, so you may already know this story, but I just found this out recently, um, that this, oh, oh, and that's another one. Oh, I put that in, okay. I just made it bigger, because I thought it was too pretty to not do that. Um, 
This image was taken, um, anyone know who took this one? Neil Armstrong took this picture, and he's over here, there's his shadow, and there's one of his stations, and he's looking back at the rover, and when Johnson got this picture later when they were developing it, they said, hey, where were you? You weren't supposed to go anywhere far from the rover, but he was like, hey, I passed over this crater, and I know craters are really interesting, they've got a lot of great science, so I wanted to go see it. And so that, um, you can actually see his tracks over to that crater where he was never um, supposed to actually go. Uh, but he got a lot of really cool data from that. And something else I found out this summer was that he didn't only walk over to the crater and collect samples there. They had, um, I think, two suitcases. I might be wrong about that number. But they had a certain number of suitcases that they could bring back data or, or rock samples. And when they were ready to head back to um, you know, back up to the, the orbiter and, and head home, they didn't fill them. They weren't full. And so what, uh, what he did was he scooped up a whole bunch of regolith, that dusty stuff on the surface, and just filled up the suitcases with whatever was left, stuffed them in, and then went home. And he wasn't supposed to do that either, but that actually gave us a lot of information about what's out there on the surface because the regolith is mixing from all kinds of impacts and from all over the place. So those two things actually gave us a lot of information from the per first Apollo mission that weren't necessarily scripted. Yes? I, I couldn't make out the word what he called the surface. Oh, sorry. It's the regolith, R-E-G-O-L-I-T-H. And it's that, that stuff on the surface that's powdered rock, basically, and bits of glass, and, and things that are, are made from the bombardment over time, and also from when volcanoes spewed out um, uh, lava, but it, sometimes it comes out if there's a lot of um, like water or gases in there, it'll make little glass crystals because they shoot up in the air and they cool so fast that they just turn into glass. And we can get these little spheres in the regolith from, from that instant cooling of liquid. Yes? It's not confined to the moon, although you normally hear it from the moon. But yeah, we have regolith on Earth, too. It's just any unconsolidated stuff on the surface. Typically, you think of regolith as, um, as bits of rock, and, um, and we often call this soil when there's organic material in there. But other people talk about lunar soil as well. Um, and so it just, but regolith can be on any planetary surface. So if you want to impress people at cocktail parties, you let them know. <laughs> You're not wrong. They just might not know it. So the, the, the standard regulus, if there is such a thing in the moon, uh, comparison to the Earth would be volcanic ash? Yeah. Um, you could actually call all of this stuff that's not solid rock okay, regolith the, if you the, wanted to. If you were going to go out and grab a handful of regolith on, on the lunar surface mm. and say, OK, what can I find on Earth that's close to that volcanic ash? Yeah. Close? That's pretty close, yeah. And actually, if you're really interested, you can get lunar soil simulant. And you can buy it online, and you can take it home and, and find out what it's like. And if you live near Goddard, NASA Goddard, we are going to have some at our International Observe the Moon Night event on October 12th. And I'll tell you more about that. But if you want to see it, we're going to have some. Or you can buy it online. Um, I wanted to show you kind of a neat uh, picture about what we see at different times. So I'm going to pull up this website. And so this is from all of um, the different Apollo landing sites. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera has a collection of all of these things. And I just wanted to show you what we see at different sun angles. So I'm just going to pick, um, pick a spot. But then you can actually take the sun and drag it over and see what you can see at different sun angles. So sometimes, like, I mean, look at those tracks. That's so cool. But um, you can, depending on where the sun is, you can see different things. So there is a reason that we, we have it. And this is just, oh, I could do this all day. But yeah, pretty, pretty cool. And this is online. If you just look for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, you can find it. Um, but it's, it's up there, and it's available to anyone um, if, you're, if you're interested. And I wanted to show you that. Oh. Yes? Question. As you were moving that slider across, um, I noticed that some of those very small craters were brightening very 
highly. And I just was curious, I saw that in the overall picture of the moon there. There was like these little very bright white dots. Ah, so some of those bright white dots are not craters. So for example, in this image here, so we have a crater here and a crater here, and, and we have actually a lot of boulders. So oh, in there, so yeah. So some of those things that you're seeing are boulders and they often sort of disappear when the sun is more overhead because their shadow is straight down. But, and you can see also from the craters how the sunlight, sometimes it, it's going from different sides, but a lot of those are actually boulders. Yeah, so you can tell what's a boulder or a crater based on, you know, if here, if this crater is lit on this side, the sunlight must be coming from here, and the things that are lit on that side, so if it's shadowed on this side and bright on this side, and that's a crater, if it's bright on the opposite side and shadowed on the opposite side, that means it's sticking out and it's a boulder or a positive feature on the surface. So go and play. It's pretty cool. I encourage you to take a look. All right. OK, so let's see what else we've got here. Um, OK, so we've also really improved impact crater science. So we have a lot of impact craters on the moon. And we can, we can image them at different times. And I just wanted to show you some pretty pictures, although they're harder to see on here. But we can look at the craters from the top. We can take really, really, so here is a whack mosaic, so the wide angle camera. Here's the narrow angle camera really zooming in on different features. You can also slew the spacecraft, so you can take a side view of these, of these craters and see what the sides look like. They're just amazing. And I have actually some of these. So the last one was Aristarchus, and we've also made these models of them, so it's an L rock image, and then we made it with the topography. So if you're interested in seeing any of these, here's the next one we've got is Tycho, and we've got one of Tycho as well. So you can come up and take a, a closer look afterwards. Um, but yeah, we have the, the big camera, but I had to show you, of course, the central peak of Tycho because it's amazing. This is our beauty shot. This is what we are putting all over the walls, all over Goddard, and all over Arizona, and everywhere. And do you see that, um, that boulder on the top? Anyone want to take a, a guess about how big that is? Show us again, which one? This one right there. So it looks small. It looks small, yeah. 20 meters? 20 meters? No, no, no. <laughs> Several houses. Not, 100, 100 meters. Oh, it's a small town. <laughs> it's the size of a baseball stadium an entire stadium. It could fill the entire stadium. And this was really cool. It's sort of like a little golf ball on a tee up there. And when this was, came out, when we got this, and it was sent all over the LRO science team, it was so much fun because no one understands why it's there. This completely doesn't fit in with our impact cratering models. It should not be there according to what we know about impact crater science. And yet, it is. So it must be able to be there because it is there. So we have to refigure out our, our understanding of how impact craters formed based on images like this that tell us, OK, you have to allow for this in your model of how an impact crater forms. And this stuff is happening all the time. And I just think it's so cool. And you can, you can look at how the impact melt sloshes up on the central peak to figure out the timing of different events in there. And it's just, it's so cool. So I, I had to really just zoom in and show you this baseball stadium on top of a mountain. Just incredible. All right, we have also been getting information about the illumination. Remember, that's something that we wanted to know about um, what, what areas are in shadow, what areas are lit. This is just one example from LROC. Um, LOLA, the L L Lunar A Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter, um, also has these kinds of data as well. But this is from about a month from 85 degrees south to uh, 90 degrees south. And it has gone through and taken images all month and put them all together. And every time an area gets sunlight, it gets a value of 1. And every time it doesn't, it gets a value of 0. And they have just taken this bimodal um, system for, for stacking their photographs and putting them all together. And over the course of a month, this area never got light. 
this area got a lot of light and this area got an intermediate amount of light and you can tell by how black or how white it is how often it gets sunlight and they can do this this is just one month they can do it for every month they can do it for the entire mission um, and Lola with the with the um, its ability to figure out what the surface looks like it can make models of how the sunlight should interact with the surface and then they can compare the actual images to their models and figure out okay this area has almost 100% sunlight all year long which is amazing or this one has no sunlight at all over the course of a year or even billions of years all right something then you can do is once you have your illumination maps you can figure out how they correlate with likely locations of water as collected by lind um, so in this strangely illuminated one, these dark areas coincide with the most likely water at the south pole of the moon. Um, and what's really cool is that these do not perfectly match with your dark areas. They have a lot of correlation, but not 100%. And that is something that was not expected when we got there. We thought, okay, dark areas, more water, likely not so so we have to explain that and we have to understand it and we don't know it yet so all of you out there if you're interested and you've got an idea let the LEN team know because they're still trying to work this out all right I had also mentioned um, I should have shown this just invisible as well but I wanted to show the big pictures so this is a crater that has and you can come see this on my computer afterwards if you want because it's kind of hard to see but here's the crater and this outline here I don't know if you can see it very well but this is impact melt coming from the crater and this is actually a whole heck of a lot of impact melt we would this is a pretty small crater I should have had a scale on there I think it's about 10 kilometers across and it wasn't expected to have that much melt and it does and this is all buried underneath regolith under that fine powdery stuff so you can't see it in visible images but you can in the radar images so we're using the radar to help us um, understand what is going on in the visible images as well some other cool stuff someone had mentioned they wanted protection if they went up to the moon well we have been finding um, pits and we've also found natural bridges which are pretty cool to find on the moon so what you're seeing here are two pictures of the same feature so here this is actually the bridge and this is actually the shadow of the bridge the sun is coming from this direction so this whole thing is a hole and it's hollow underneath and you can see the sunlight that's entering over here actually shining on the floor underneath the natural bridge over here and then here's the shadow of the bridge and there's sunlight and here's the same image at a different angle or the same feature at a different angle and here's the bridge and the shadow of the bridge is right next to it um, and it's all illuminated on the floor and that's the other part so if you search on the LROC website you can find these also if you want more images but they have repeat imaging and this is something that we didn't expect to find necessarily but it's probably from a lava tube that collapsed um, and just that that bridge is remaining on top so pretty cool these are these are new results um, we had never seen these before we didn't have the imagery to to find them oh we also have been finding spacecraft so <laughs> pretty cool we, we've been looking Luna cold I don't I don't know actually how you say that anyone know how you pronounce that name new it might not be Luna cold, but that's how I, Luna could, I don't know. I am not Russian. Oh, actually I am Russian, that's really sad. I am Russian, but I, I should send this to my relatives and tell them to help me out here. Um, but this was uh, something that had been sent to the moon and we lost contact with it and didn't know where it was. And 42 years later, LROC finds it. And this is so cool, this is actually, it has a reflective device out there with it and so I don't know if you're aware but many of you probably are but Apollo left all kinds of um, reflectors on the surface that we still bounce laser beams off of they're a science experiment that we are still using today um, and we can actually measure how the moon is moving away from us and how it's um, yeah basically how it's moving away and, and its orientation in space based on repeated laser bounces off the moon coming back to Earth. Well, Lunacold had one as well, has one, and, and the laser teams have been shooting off lasers towards that area that they expect it to be for years, never found it. 
One week after they found this, they shot the laser beam up and actually reflected off of Lunacold's um, reflector. So they had thought, oh, it's covered in dust. We wouldn't be that far off. We could do it. And nope, they just needed to know where it was. So that's an, an area that they had really been wanting data from the moon, and now they have it. So really exciting. And actually, um, I didn't put anything in, in my slides about this, but LRO, something that really makes it special, is that it has um, a laser team at Goddard that actually shoots up laser beams directly to the spacecraft. So they go right up and shine off of Lola, actually, a, p a piece of Lola, and come back. And we are able to precisely determine the location of LRO, which is why we can get the topography so well. Because in order to really understand what the surface looks like, you need to know both how far the surface is from the spacecraft, but also where your spacecraft is. If you don't know where the spacecraft is, you can only get so, so precise on your measurements. But we know where the spacecraft is because of the, the laser team here at Goddard. All right, we've also found the incredible shrinking moon. Who's heard of that? All right, we got one. So yeah, this is really neat because we have found that in the geologically recent past, the moon is shrinking. There are um, these scarps all over the moon, which are these features here. They're sort of like wrinkles. And they indicate that there is a crunching effect. There is, there is um, a shrinkage in that area. And we have found this all over the moon. We were aware of some of these even back during the Apollo times, but we didn't know the spatial distribution of these features, and now we do. So all over the moon, there is enough of these features that it indicates that in the relatively recent past, meaning millions of years, which is nothing to a geologist, and you know, to astronomers as well, that's nothing either. So you're with me on this. But, um, but the moon may still be active, and this is from um, cooling as a result of um, it's cooling off since it formed, and that cooling is causing shrinking. So this is, this is pretty cool. All right, we also have the best topography of the lunar surface in the solar system. We know the topography of the moon better than we know the topography of Earth. Anyone know why? Water. Yeah. We have oceans, and we do not know the shape of the oceans as well as we know the shape of the lunar surface which is kind of amazing. Um, and I wanted to show you um, just a, uh, let me get out of here. I, ha uh, I can't leave my PowerPoint. And I wanted to just show you what that actually, can't get over, what that looks like. So let's see if this will play for me. Nope. So you can see, uh, not on the full screen. We'll see if this will do it. It's good enough. Okay. So this is what we knew before LRO, and that's what we know afterwards about the shape. I oh, know. Sorry, I'm blocking it's you. It's like here. standard def and high def. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So really improved our understanding of the topography of the moon. All right, let me stop that and go back. OK. So, so do we know the topography to one meter scale? Not, not the entire moon. No, we, we know it. You know, I should really, I don't recall what the latest is. It's getting better and better all the time um, because of, you know, repeated Lola measurements and and actually LROC can help us with topography as well because with the um, digital elevation models from the slightly slewed angles, but I don't know what it is now. It just keeps getting better though. They would love it down to that much though. <laughs> should do so well I know, I know. Um, we also have day and night temperature maps for the whole moon. So of course this is not something that you'd see at one time. This is day all over the moon. This is night all over the moon. That never happens just like it's not day everywhere on Earth and night everywhere on Earth at one time. Um, but we do have very good information about that. And I wanted to sort of 
jump off and say that Lola doesn't only do topography and, and doesn't only, oh, this should have gone before, but we can also look at the surface reflectance and the slope. And this is Shackleton Crater. This is actually from a recent science paper. Um, and we're looking actually at, we think there is frost inside Shackleton Crater. And we can tell that because of the surface reflectance um, compared to how it appears outside of the crater. And Shackleton is a permanently shadowed crater. And also the slope um, indicates that uh, they, they think that the frost is building on some of those high slope areas. But they don't think that the reflectance is a result of recent activity exclusively. They do think that there may have been um, frost inside the crater. So Lola is helping us learn that as well. So just wanted to show another, another image from Lola. So we also have our temperature, yep, and this was supposed to be the South Pole temperature right after that other one. Um, but here is, is the South Pole of the moon has the coldest temperature ever measured in the entire solar system, which is pretty cool. It's kind of chilly. Um, I, I had it on, I think it's, it's about, what is it, about 28 Kelvin, I think is what they came down to, which is pretty cold considering that all atomic motion stops at zero. This is the place for earmuffs. If you go, bring them. Um, very warm ones. Um, but yes, this is the coldest measured place, colder than Pluto. And the reason for that is, again, those permanent shadows. It doesn't get sunlight in there. So it's colder even though it's closer to the sun because it doesn't get illuminated. Um, what we know of Pluto anyway, of course, we're going to find out more with our, our New Horizons mission going out. But um, it, there are no areas that have quite as large of areas with as little sunlight in them as on the moon, in the solar system anyway. So kind of cool. Um, something else we found, more radiation coming off the surface than we expected. There's actually twice as much coming off the surface. We expected this much. Um, we expected that as you go towards the moon, that big object blocks the radiation from space around it, but it doesn't block all of it. It actually reflects some of it. And that was something we did not expect to find. Um, and we're also measuring what, what is going on over time with the sun. So as we talked about, you know, the sun was pretty inactive in the beginning. So you can tell in the beginning, the crater team was kind of like, okay, we're getting ready. We're getting this sort of baseline. And then all of a sudden, you know, it started getting more excited. And so we, we got some better data, right? Actually, that was even in 2010. So in the beginning, they were kind of bummed out, but, but then they got some more. And we're getting even more solar storms now. Um, we also like to play with other spacecrafts. So there are several spacecrafts at the moon right now. Um, of course, LCROSS was some of our original imaging. The GRAIL spacecraft, the one that measured the gravity of the moon, um, or the gravity map of the moon, um, <coughs> named Ebb and Flow, uh, just recently impacted. And we were able to, to, and wow, you can't see that at all. But <laughs> here's the lunar surface, and here is the slit that LAMP uses to collect data. They have a little window that they open up and they are able to collect data from that. And then we're able to um, make models of, of the different volatile distributions that, that come out from, from these impacts. And we're also able to see them um, with our LROC camera. So those are just a very few. I know it seemed like a lot and I, I could have kept you here all day and I, I won't do that. But those are some of the things that we're finding out with LRO. I wanted to mention Laddie briefly because it is very cool, um, and it launched last night at 11.37 p.m. from Mars. Did you know that? Yes. Wallops Flight Facility is now the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. <laughs> so it was a moon launch from Mars. And I had to tell you about this because that doesn't happen all that often. It's actually the first, um, the first <laughs> mission to the moon that went from there. And it's called the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. And a lot of people hear that and think, well, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. But it does. It does. It has what's called a surface boundary exosphere, um, which means that none of the particles in the atmosphere actually touch. They're all just sort of floating around and don't, they're not aware of any other particles. They just, it's a collisionless atmosphere, which is kind of neat. And actually, um, so we want to find out about it. Um, so it's very thin. The, the 
thing we can see most in it from Earth is the sodium. Sodium has a very high reflectance, we're able to see it, but we expect other species to be in the atmosphere that we are going to be paying attention to. Um, and the dust part, oh, and, and again, so I should have said this before, the surface boundary exosphere, we're really interested in it because we think it may be the most common atmosphere in the, uh, it's not maybe, it is the most common atmosphere in the solar system because several small planets and moons and asteroids have this type of atmosphere. And so we have one right in our own backyard. So we wanna learn about it before we start building these lunar colonies or, or doing other things that will really affect the surface um, or, and, and then therefore affect what's in the atmosphere around the moon. So, so we see this all over the solar system. And then that dust part, um, you may know from Surveyor, we have these horizon glow images that Surveyor collected back in 1968 um, from an orbiting uh, position. And then also Eugene Cernan very famously drew this picture of what he called these you know, this horizon glow. And so we're trying to figure out what that was. We also have measurements um, from the lunar ejecta and meteorites experiment from Apollo that indicate um, an increase in the amount of stuff that was hitting the experiment at dawn and dusk. And we think this may be lofted dust, actually, because the moon has this very interesting charge environment. Um, one side is very positive and one side is very negative. And at that terminator, the positive, which is on the solar side, and the negative, which is on the dark side, meet. And so this has scientists all over God are super excited. There's a whole hallway of scientists that are right next to me that just love talking about the charged environment on the moon. Um, and so they're trying to figure out whether it's able to loft dust or whether you know impacts are needed to get some dust in the air and then the charged environment keeps it up. And we're not sure yet, but, but dust in the lunar sky is possible um, and, and seems likely. Um, so we're going to find out more about it. And that's why Laddie is going to orbit at the terminator to get into that charged environment as often as possible to figure out what's going on. Um, I wanted to show you some, some Laddie pictures. This is Laddie getting ready to go. And what's kind of cool about Laddie is it was a modular design, meaning that each of these pieces, you know, they can make tons of them. And actually Laddie used to be one a block shorter. And then they realized based on the fuel that they wanted to use, it needed to be a little bit bigger. So they just added another block on and they were good to go. And that's not common with most spacecraft. They normally are designed very specifically for their purpose, but LADI is a new type of concept and we'll see if other instruments do that as well. Something else that they did to minimize complexity um, was this whole um, spacecraft is covered in solar panels. So it doesn't have anything that needs to extend once it gets to the moon. It's ready to go and it can sort of tumble anywhere and it will still get sunlight. So they don't want it to tumble, but should it, um, it'll still be illuminated, which is, which is kind of nice. So again, it was supposed to launch and it was Wallops Island, Virginia, but I, I should have put the Mars in there because I just think that's so cool. Um, the moon launched from Mars. Um, and this was a, a new spacecraft that it launched from. We have had Minotaur 4 launches before, but no Minotaur 5. This was the first one. And it went last night. This is from Phil Weary. And he sent this picture out to the Novak listserv last night and was able to see and his is even better on my computer, but you can tell where it's going and I can see it all the way up to there. So pretty cool. This is the first, again, moon launch from Wallops, from Mars. Um, but who knows, maybe there will be more. So you might have the chance to see this sometime in your area. It, there was um, visibility all over the East Coast, uh, but pretty low in the sky from here and our Eastern horizon didn't allow us to see it, unfortunately. All right. so. Just gonna take a few minutes to let you know that there are ways for you to get involved if you are interested. Um, something that we have here is called Moon Mappers. And this has uh, two different options for, for helping us sort through all the data that we're getting from LRO, specifically the LROC data, because there is just too much for the scientists to get. We have more data from this mission than every other planetary mission combined. So, it is, I was told that if you stacked up all of 
the data as of like a year ago on, um, on CDs and put them without cases, they would reach the top of the Washington Monument. So that is the amount of data that we have and we cannot sort through it all. Um, so we have um, some crater um, activities and also trying to figure out, how, to help with crater counting is one of them and also to help find cool features that you may see uh, on the moon that maybe the scientists haven't found yet. You can do that through moon mappers. Um, and that's, that's something that the science team actually really appreciates because, again, they can't look through it all. And so students often help as well through a lunar student imaging program. And they have found cool stuff like some of the pits that the scientists hadn't known about yet. So other people looking at the data is really important. Also, something for everyone who's looking at the sky um, during the next few months, Laddie is very interested in having you count meteors because something that really affects the lunar atmosphere is what's happening on the surface. So if there's a lot of meteors here, then that's probably about what's happening at the moon. And so we want to know what could be affecting the data that Laddie is collecting. So there is an app for that. It's called Meteor Counter. And you can just log in and, and just tick off when you see meteors coming and, and the science team will use that to help understand what's happening at the moon. So meteor counter. And this is, um, so Laddie has a 100 day mission and it, it, it actually is taking about a month to get to the moon, but they're still interested in, in figuring out what's happening with the lunar atmosphere right now. Um, but we have some good, good meteors coming up and this slide doesn't look very good, but Geminids, for example, are gonna be during the, the Laddie mission time scale. So, so take a look during the mission and let, let the science team know what's going on. All right, there's also, if you are interested in any of these LROC images, I think they're beautiful and very interesting. The science team writes up an explanation about different images and posts them like one to three times a week. And you can just see the pretty images and then get a description of what you're seeing in those images. Um, and that happens all the time on the LROC website. You can also sort through the LROC data. You can zoom around and, and find different, um, different images, different areas if you're interested. The science team uses this a lot for to planning where they want to take their next images and, and just looking through the data. Or there is this lunar mapping and modeling portal, um, which website didn't show up at the bottom, but it's just lmmp.nasa.gov. And it has a lot of different lunar data sets. So it has LRO. It also has um, some of the, the previous missions. Um, and it, it's all collected in there. I think they're going to even put some Apollo data in there. Um, but, but lots of, you can get mineralogy data and things like that too. So all in the mapping and modeling portal. What's the LROC site? Um, it's, let's see, I wonder if I have it. Um, whoops. So lroc.se.se.asu.edu. Oh, and it chopped off part of it. But if you just look up LROC also, this will be the place that takes you. Um, all right, and I, I did want to let you know if you are or know a middle school science teacher, uh, we have lunar workshops every summer um, at Goddard and around the country, um, mostly at Goddard now because of travel restrictions. <laughs> um, but, but we talk about you know, the lunar science and exploration and how you can bring science and data to your classrooms. So, anyone knows, anyone interested, um, please come talk to me. Those are, those are my little purview on, I'm the formal education lead for Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so I can, I'd be happy to talk to you about those. But if you are anyone, anywhere, this next one is for you. This is International Observe the Moon Night. And it is a worldwide celebration about the moon. We encourage everyone around the world to get outside and look up and see the moon and find out more about it. If Maybe if you go to, um, you can either organize your own event. My parents have one on their back porch all the time, invite the neighbors over and hang out. My cat, you know, gets together with the neighborhood cats because I have to test out the website, so I have to register somewhere. But everyone else has a real, um, a real event. Um, and so we have them at Goddard. We, Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout troops, libraries, schools, museums, science centers all over the world have them. 
Um, I forget how many, I think we had about 554 events last year in 24 different countries. Um, and it's just getting bigger and bigger every year. Um, on our website, there are, is a place to register your event, but also a place, and if you register, then you get stuff for hosts. So we'll send you, you know, here are flyers that you can use. Here is um, an evaluation card that you can hand out to your, to your um, participants who come. Um, and sometimes we're able to give out materials or some materials. So if you register, we are able to, to get you hooked up with all of those or, or hook you up with local astronomy clubs. Or if you're astronomy club members, hook you up with others who are, are having events and would love people with telescopes to come and talk about the moon. We have lots of different resources for hosts on the website. So check it out. Um, and I just wanted to finish off with just a few websites if anyone's interested. The LRO website, the Laddie website, um, pretty much everything NASA Lunar Science is now collected on one website, moon.nasa.gov, um, and we're trying to keep that updated, but that's a pretty easy one to remember. Also, visualizations. Has anyone heard of the Scientific Visualization Studio? All right, we got one. This is one of the best websites ever. I encourage you to go here because the SVS team at Goddard is amazing. They are just incredible. They have all different science concepts related to the moon, to earth, to planets, to astronomy, to all kinds of stuff in like short clips and they're wonderful. Um, they have things like dial a moon. You can find out the moon phase for any day of the year. We have a southern hemisphere version of what the phases look like from the southern hemisphere because a lot of people don't do that. We have, you know, just all kinds of stuff on there. I would really encourage you to go. And then of course, like everyone else, we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, um, and you can follow us and find out what's going on with our latest um, what was the activity. Site you just mentioned? The scientific visualization studio. It's SVS. GSFC for Goddard Space Flight Center dot NASA dot gov. Could you do that again? Oh, sure, and I'm right in front of it. So it's SVS dot GSFC dot NASA dot gov. Yeah. So at NASA Goddard, you can go and actually see this, and a big, huge sphere that scientists can visualize the data that uh, allows them to just walk up and see it, as opposed to trying to play around on a, on a flat computer screen forever and ever. And, and you can actually uh, just um, see so much uh, in false color imagery over actual Im imagery and just get a lot better uh, depiction of the data. Yeah, and that's actually the science on a sphere. So that's SOS. Um, but we have that too at Goddard. And, we, and at the Scientific Visualization Studio, they, of course, work with the spheres as well. And also huge um, just flat screen panels as well but all kinds of stuff. So that's just a little bit about LRO and Laddie and, and some things that are going on with the moon. Um, if you are interested in looking at any of the toys I brought from, from Mars and from the moon, come on up. You're welcome to see it. This is actually a full-scale model of a Curiosity wheel here. Um, so th there are six of these on the Curiosity rover. Um, and you can also see the, the JPL and Morse code on the side here. Um, but if you're interested in, in talking any more about these or, or seeing we have some cool lenticulars that show you different data sets and how they compare. Um, so come take a look. But thank you very much. I'm really glad you're here and I'm, I'm glad I got to be with you today. <laughs> I'd be happy to take any questions either as a group or come on up. Yeah. I didn't understand about the orbit. Is it Hector Turner orbit? Is oh, okay. studying the Terminator? That's the Terminator. Okay. It does, um, but it's actually more interested in in the line. But so it's so if you have, I want to want a sphere. So you're right. So the, the Terminator line would be like this. But we just want to pass over it. And then we can pass over it once, twice, three times, and just keep doing that. If we were going, if we were going up and down, it would, um, it would sort of sweep over us. But we actually wouldn't be able to pass through it as often as the orbit that they created equatorially. So that's why they did that. But good question. Yeah. And, and I will also say that that was a debate that they had, whether they wanted to be polar or whether they wanted to be on the Terminator. Because, of course, as, as someone had mentioned, 
you, you don't get the entire moon data if you just go around the equator. If you go around the poles, you do get to cover the entire moon. Um, but it was just a decision the science team had to make. Actually, Paul Mahaffey at Goddard was the guy who said, nope, this is the orbit I want. And they said, OK. <laughs> but but there, was, there was a debate about that, yeah. When you said um, the moon's orbit was like one, one degree, roughly, on the other, was that with respect to the Earth? Ecliptic. OK, so with respect to the sun. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that and and it is interesting because it's yeah it's about one and a half degrees from the sun. If it was just from Earth, um, that would be. So it's orbiting twenty three degrees with respect to the Earth. No, it is it is orbiting. Um, yes, actually, yes, it is. Sorry, <laughs> it took me a minute to catch on. But yeah, so it's a little bit higher and a little bit lower in the sky sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You'll see why we Oh, sorry, and I can pull those out of the rubber bands too. <laughs> oh, yes, and I was going to open those up also.